Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honoured guests. My name is Chris Rezos, and I'll be um, making some of the announcements during the day uh, concerning the, the awardees. Um, I'm currently the president-elect of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, and Catherine Waller, who you'll be introduced to in a short while, is the president of the IUGG. Of course, you know that we're here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of 1919. On the stage, we have um, a number of uh, important guests, which I'd like to introduce you to, um, starting from the, you know, your left to right. Uh, Lacina Zerbo, who is the Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. To his left, Elena Mananekova, I hope I pronounced that correctly, Deputy Secretary General of the World Meteorological Organization. Then there is uh, Catherine Waller, who I just mentioned. She's the President of the IEGG. And our guest of honor, I'm pleased to see, his Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. To his left, uh, Shamila Nair Bordella, Assistant Director General for Natural Sciences here at UNESCO. And again to her left is Heidi Hackman, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the International Science Council. And to her left is Ricardo Mena, Chief of Support and Monitoring of the Sendai Framework Implementation of the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. So now I will pass the lectern to Catherine. Your Serene Highness, other distinguished guests, and I actually should also say other distinguished people who live here or work here as well. <laughs> Um, representatives in international unions, institutions and organizations, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this celebration of the centenary of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, or IUGG. As Chris has just said, I'm the current president of the union. In sharp contrast to the 100 years of the IUGG, this is a position I have held for a little less than two weeks. The opening ceremony beginning today's proceedings includes awards to representatives of key partners of the IUGG. You will hear more about the union's history later in the day. Suffice to say just now is that in 1919, the International Research Council was formed, designed to re-energize international research activity and cooperation that had lapsed during the First World War. One of its first acts was to promote the formation of international unions to further science in subject areas where international cooperation is essential. As a result of this, the IUGG came into being 100 years ago yesterday, bringing together existing international organizations and activity in the scientific fields of geodesy and, ge and geophysics. It had nine founding member countries. Eight of them are represented here today to receive an award in this opening ceremony. The International Research Council function today as an overarching body for all scientific unions is served by the International Science Council. We will hear from its chief executive officer shortly. The International Astronomical Union was formed at the same time as the IUGG and several other international unions receiving partnership awards today have histories dating back to a similar era. We are enormously privileged to have His Serenus Highness with us. He and his family's connection to IUGG will be outlined during the morning. The underpinning fundamental science we all do is as important today as it was a century ago but the research landscape in which we operate and the societal issues we aim to address have transformed the way we work. Supercomputers, even computers, the space age and satellite observations, the World Wide Web, sustainable development goals, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, climate change, ecosystem services, and many other terms familiar to today's science scientists were unknown then. 
Over the intervening century, the unions and other international organizations have enabled scientists to collaborate and co cooperate more effectively and brought a spectrum of ideas to bear on the question of how to solve the world's most pressing problems. The need for the IUGG and its counterparts is as great as ever as we move into our second century. Let us now hear from representatives of some of them as we start this centenary ce celebration. First is Shamila Nabeduel, Assistant Director General for Natural Sciences here at UNESCO. Thank you very much, Ms. Catherine, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Your Serene Highness, dear Professor Sideris, President of the International Union of Geo Geodesy and Geophysics, dear Professor Cheng, President of the International Union of Geological Sciences, the IUGS, distinguished representatives, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor on behalf of Madam Audrey Azuli, the Director General of UNESCO, to welcome you here this morning to the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the IUGG here at UNESCO headquarters. I'm sure you will all agree with me that a better understanding of the Earth is essential for the diversity of life and the future of human society. But you will also agree with me that it is also amongst us and essential to understand the Earth and find solutions to understanding our Earth's needs. All human activities are related to the interaction with planet Earth. Hence, the basic knowledge then about our Earth is key to development of an informed citizenry. Your Excellencies, Your Serene Highness, the IUGG was established in 1946 and maintains a working relationship with UNESCO and its scientific bodies such as the International Oceanographic Commission and the Intergovernmental Hydrology Program. This collaboration with UNESCO is via the different associations of IUGS and these are the International Association of the Physical Sciences of the Oceans and the International Association of the Hydrological Sciences. The International Hydrological Program and Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission are to date the only intergovernmental programs within the United Nations system to be fully committed to freshwater and its management. In the case of IHP and marine resources, in the case of IOC. <clears throat> Excellencies, water is a vital need for almost all activities and life on Earth and its management and governance influence the health, gender equality, education and livelihoods, and our environment. Making water resources a key element of sustainable development and poverty reduction. However, the water resources are subject to a lot of hazards, such as the variation of demand, various pollution, or climate hazards. For this reason, the projects developed and supported by the IHP and the IOC are intended to provide sustainable, interdisciplinary, cross-sectoral solutions to help reduce the vulnerability and build our community's resilience. In addition, the IHP supports projects on transboundary waters. These projects are more complex and require specific know-how of which diplomacy is part of. The water diplomacy contributes to promoting peace through cooperation and development of shared waters across the world. The Intergovernmental Hydrology Program and the IUG's IAHS has been cooperating in the field of hydrological sciences for decades. They have also organized dozens of conferences together, and these include the Friend, Friends, the COVAX, and we are delighted to be part of this initiative. It is therefore a great honor for us to welcome IUGG and its associations, including the International Association of Seismology and Physics of the Earth Interior and the International Association of Volcanology and Chemistry of the Earth Interior, which we are delightful to be a partner with you. All this is in the framework of the UNESCO International Geoscience Program 
which is related to earthquake and volcano hazards and risks. Distinguished colleagues, your serene highness, the International Geoscience Program at UNESCO is a shining example of collaboration on understanding the Earth's interior. This program is a knowledge hub of UNESCO to facilitate international scientific cooperation in the geosciences. This international geoscience program, your program, actually includes promoting the sustainable use of natural resources, advancing new initiatives related to geodiversity and geoheritage and geohazards risk mitigation. In 2015, 195 member states of UNESCO recognized the label of UNESCO Geoparks program. Today, there are 147 geoparks in 41 countries. These geoparks are single unified geographical areas and landscapes of international geological significance, our heritage, which is managed with the holistic concept of protection, education, and sustainable development. I cannot but not refer to the articles which appear in the newspaper today, 29th of July. The study of the Global Footprint Network has raised concerns that an equivalent of 1.75 planet would be required to produce enough to meet humanity's needs given our current consumption. How then do we valorize the Earth's natural resources? The Earth signs hold the record of our small planet, a record stretching back 4,600 million years. Humanity has been here just for a tiny fraction of that time, yet it is increasingly obvious the threat we pose to life on Earth. We have but a short time to transform modern society in order to secure a sustainable future for all. And our collaboration with the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics is an important endeavor in that direction. How can we solicit our children to study and valorize the Earth that we live in? The Earth is our only home and the source from which all known life originates. We live in a closed system. Everything we have to do has an impact somewhere. I therefore would like to wish you fruitful deliberations and continue to valorize our Mother Earth. And thank you, Your Serene Highness. Thank you. Our next speaker is Heide Hackman, CEO of the International Science Council. You're just reading? I've got slides. That should be Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I too am absolutely delighted to be, to be part of today's celebration and on behalf of the International Science Council, the ISC, to congratulate and to thank the IUGG, its leadership, its community, past and present, for 100 years of scientific achievement that has been so fundamental to our understanding of planet Earth and is so relevant to the challenges we now face. In this slide, you see reference to only some of the great triumphs of this 100-year adventure. Suffice it to say, that not only has the IUGG family contributed great scientific discoveries, but the union itself has been instrumental in stimulating the evolution of international science over the last century. It has been a foundational and vital partner in the journey of institutional development that led just over a year ago to the merger of the International Council for Science and the International Social Science Council and therefore to the creation of the International Science Council. Throughout this time, the IUGG has played a major role in creating truly impactful international initiatives, like the International Geophysical Year, which resulted in a quite extraordinary growth of understanding about the Earth, and the World Climate Research Program, which continues to be essential to successive assessments of the IPCC.
initiatives that the International Science Council now proudly includes in its legacy of achievements. And today, the IUGG continues to work through engaged leadership on demonstrating and realizing the full potential of the ISC and therefore its future success. Ladies and gentlemen, we celebrate today at a time of great opportunity and challenge for science and for organizations like the IUGG and the ISC. It's a time in which society unquestionably need science and specifically international interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary science more than ever. The biggest and most urgent challenge to contemporary science is to identify tractable pathways to global sustainability and to assist in the creation and promotion of policies and of public action that can successfully move societies along those pathways. Pathways that navigate the complexity of planetary dynamics and integrate processes of deep social change in order to address endemic issues of conflict, of poverty and inequality. A challenge most prominently reflected in the 2030 Agenda and the globally agreed Sustainable Development Goals. A challenge for all societies, for all science in all parts of the world. We also meet at a time when digital technologies which have revolutionized the means by which information and knowledge are acquired, stored, communicated and used offer profound new opportunities to science. If exploited and used effectively, the big data that fuel AI algorithms have the potential to reveal deep patterns in nature and society that have been hitherto unknown or inaccessible raising new questions for science, driving scientific discovery. Stephen Hawking, the great cosmologist, predicted at the turn of the millennium that the 21st century would be, for science, the century of complexity. We now have the intellectual infrastructure at hand to analyze and address the complexity that lies at the heart of the major global challenges of sustainable development. At the same time as science is gearing uh, or changing gear to help address those challenges, we find ourselves in a situation in which science is too often not brought to the decision-making table and in which scientific understanding and interpretation appear to be less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion or beliefs based on personal experience. This affects all scientific fields and it is of great concern as our future health and survival depend on public action and government policies that have a robust scientific basis. And finally, we meet at a time when national and international science systems themselves are under tremendous pressure to change. There are pressures for more openness, for more engagement with society, with other types of knowledge, for effective recognition and inclusion of underrepresented groups, for evaluation and incentive systems that are better adapted to current priorities, for rapid adjustment to novel technolo technological developments, for updated standards of integrity and responsibility to protect and optimize the public good. Colleagues, these are the four great domains of opportunity and challenge that the ISC has prioritized and in which it will act as a catalyst and convener of international scientific expertise, advice and influence, drawing strength from its unique membership, which includes 40 international scientific unions like the IUGG, and exploiting its accredited role within the UN system in order to articulate a strong and credible voice that can speak and stand for science as a global public good. The value and impact of our work will depend fundamentally on our ability to forge and foster partnerships. Partnerships like the one we have been privileged to enjoy with the IUGG. So in conclusion, we look to the IUGG as we have in the past for vision, for leadership, 
and engagement with the broader international scientific community in facing new and possibly even greater challenges. Colleagues, your first century is over. Time now to roll up our sleeves for the second. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Haider. Our next speaker is Elena Renenkova, who is the Deputy Secretary General for the World Meteorological Organization. Thank you very much, Cathy. Uh, Madam President, Your Serene Highness, Excellencies, dear colleagues, it's a big pleasure and honor for me to, to stand here in front of you on actually behalf of the hundreds of my colleagues in the World Meteorological Organization who all wanted to, to convey their word of um, congratulations to the IUGG colleagues through you here in this room. I will not be able to speak of all of the greetings which they have passed, but I will try to select few examples to show how the century changed us, both IUGG and WMO, because it appeared that IUGG was the longest partner of World Meteorological Organization, the first non-governmental organization with whom WMO signed agreement 66 years ago in 1953. So that was the first. And it was not just agreement or working arrangement sitting in the book of agreements. That was very active partnership. Uh, today, WMO is an organization of a nine, 193 uh, member states and territories. And WMO is also very old. We are 146 years ago. So at least last 75 years, experts of IMO, our organization at that time, and IUGG, we're working together to shape the science and shape the future. And I'm glad to, to see today that WMO was receptive to this. Let's begin with the IU, uh, International Geophysical Year, 1957-58, uh, followed by International Polar Year, 50 years later. And, uh, I was not yet born when International Geophysical Year took place, but I am aware and I know very well its long-lasting legacy. But I was administrator of International Polar Year, so here I'm much more insightful. It probably would take the whole week for us to assess the legacy of this tool, but today my point is to say there were so important things happen at that period of time which now, are in play, which now influence the systems we have today. Uh, at the times of International Geophysical Year, IUDG came to WMO with a need for a systematic ozone measurement. So ozone thematic was just starting at that time. It took us a few years to establish ozone as a responsibility in WMO, and International Ozone Commission of IUGG was very instrumental, actually of EMS. So during the International Geophysical Year, uh, WMO began developing standard procedures for uniform ozone observations and established global ozone uh, um, uh, system. Uh, it was about 60 years ago, and the third Congress of WMO established this responsibility for WMO. Later, background air pollution monitoring network was created, which already uh, take care of uh, 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 ozone depleting substances, uh, precipitation chemistry, greenhouse gases, aerosols. So all in all, it was all consolidated in 1989 in the Global Atmosphere Watch, which now is a unique system which actually measures all atmospheric constituencies and standardized networks of observation and provides data for policy through the bulletins. So thanks to the experts from IUGG, which brought this up so many years ago, and the system is now working. The 2018 ozone assessment confirmed that after so many years of our joint efforts, we now see a zone recovery in the stratosphere, but this process will be very long. It will take a few decades. So our assessment says probably we will see recover, recovering of the stratospheric levels uh, at 1819 by 2060, so it will take time. But there is tiny nuance in this story. It's a zone depleting substances, which are actually powerful greenhouse gases. And we report on them in the greenhouse gas assessments. And we are seeing some fluxes which are popping up here and there, and we are concerned, and the Zone Commission is concerned too. 
We were informed recently that Azon Commission is proposing a resolution to IUGG to strengthen monitoring of Azon globally and to go a little bit in a more sustainable way regionally. So we, I would like to say that we warmly uh, welcome this. Another good story of cooperation is hydrology. My colleague from UNESCO has, has just spoke about this. There is no single agency in, in our world which, which is dealing with, with water fully. But the story of hydrology in WMO was also influenced by the IUDG. The International Association for Hydrological Sciences, which we consider one of the fathers of WMO Hydrology and Water Resource Program, has been scientific partner to our hydrology uh, program since then. Uh, the first uh, WMO Commission for Hydrology Intergovernmental was set up 73 years ago in 1943, but it took 30 years for WMO to include in the convention and its purpose operational hydrology and applications to water management. So that was done in 1975. After this, there was a long period of our collaboration and also with UNESCO and with many other partners in UN. Everyone is dealing with fresh water one way or another. However, WMO decided in just months ago in the Congress, 18 Congress, that there is a need to elevate water agenda in WMO. There were three fundamental things done. First, the Intergovernmental Hydrological Assembly was created and it had the first meeting in conjunction with the Congress. And this assembly gathers most senior operational hydrology uh, government agencies, heads. So it's directors of the National Hydrological Services. We lacked this connection for decades. So now we hope to have it. Second, uh, WMO came up with the eight uh, ambitious targets or ambitious goals for, for global water, so which includes floods and droughts, and food security, high quality data. We need a global water outlook, absolutely. Science basis knowledge for world water resources, and needs for full hydrological cycle, plus water quality. So these ambitious goals will now turn to operating plan. And the, the Congress ex exceptionally decided to have an extraordinary session of the Congress in two years, 2021, to see the, the operational plan and the plan of action coming. Welcome to this work as well. And we know that so many experts from Hydrological Association are working with us and with others on this. We also have many other joint activities. Just to mention a couple more without long stories. Joint WMO IUGG Expert Network on Volcanic Science and Application. You know that WMO has operational responsibility for the volcanic ash uh, predictions. Without your scientists, our work would be quite challenging because we don't have our own exp expert network in this. And that is uh, one of the first joint bodies we had with the partner organization. So this also influenced the way we want to work in the next century, and I will tell about this at the end. The cryosphere, global cryosphere watch of WMO, this is the least developed system so far because of the challenges of exchanging water data and glacier data. But we will not give up. With your help already, we have taken the best practices of the Cryosphere Commission, Cryosphere Association, and to put them into regulations. So WMO is global regulator, that's our, one of our speciality. So that will now implicate everyone in the world to measure and to report on the cryospheric information the way you suggested. All in all, coming to the climate, world climate research program where it's not even collaboration. I think this is symbiotic relations between IUG, WMO, International Science Council and many others. We share experts, they all work as one family. But the new things coming here as well the WCRV, World Climate Research Program, has just delivered a new science strategy, which is quite exciting. They are now working hard to prepare an implementation plan where many of your experts are involved from various associations. So the, the very uh, science week in the AGU, it's American Geophysical Union in December in San Francisco, will work more specifically on this. So there were so many things we did together which were hanging about the decade, some converted in the systems, some converted in regulations, but there was right spirit in how we do the work. So I can say that without 
being without exaggeration, that those examples helped us to actually come up with the fundamental WMO reform, which Congress of WMO approved just months ago. Right now, everyone is in the reform. Hardly anyone is not. But what WMO has done, it's a, it's a system reform. It's a, it's a change in the ways how experts through various commissions work together because we cannot do it in the compartmental ways anymore. Sector by sector, we need to work in the earth system approach. So that was the spirit of the reform. And the main drivers there is science to services, research to operations, and science to policies. So one not should be scared of this. One year ago, it was not quite certain that we will get there, but we, are, we have done it and we are very excited. Now we will open so many new avenues of so many experts from IUDG and other organizations to come directly to double more commissions through your associations and through the IUDG. So I look forward for the next century working with you. And I, th I congratulate you warmly once again for this uh, exceptional, exceptional anniversary. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ricardo Mena, Chief of Support and Monitoring of Sendai Framework Implementation, UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction. Thank you very much, Your Serene Highness, distinguished panelists, our chair and host, members of the Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting the Office for Disaster Risk Reduction to participate in the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics. Warm greetings from our special representative, Mami Misutori, who unfortunately could not be with us today due to other commitments, and who asked me specially to congratu congratulate you, all the members of the Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, on this very important occasion, and to express appreciation for the engagement and contributions towards disaster risk reduction that you have made over the years. Let me start by referring to the progress made by countries in implementing the Sendai framework based on recent stock taking at our global platform for disaster risk reduction that just happened two months ago in uh, Geneva. And um, since the adoption of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015-2030 that happened just uh, four years ago, which is the global plan to reduce disaster losses, 124 countries are now reporting through the Sendai Framework Monitor on the global targets and indicators that were adopted in Sendai. Significantly reduce number of people killed by disasters, number of people affected, direct economic losses as compared to GDP, damage to critical infrastructure and basic services, and also to increase significantly the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies, to increase DRR financing, and also countries with access to early warning systems, multi-hazard early warning systems, and risk information and assessments. These are crucial steps towards a better understanding of risk and the risk-informed implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. New research, innovative guidance, tools and instruments have been developed collaboratively. Disaster mortality actually continues on a down, downward trend. The contribution of the sciences, and significantly also from the earth and space sciences, together with better, better preparedness efforts, have contributed significantly to achieve this through better understanding of the hazards and risks the improvement of early warning systems and timely information from Earth observations. Countries are showing strong commitment to multilateralism in pursuit of integrated approaches to disaster risk reduction. 
climate change mitigation and adaptation, and sustainable development. Actually, 91 countries have reported the development of disaster risk reduction strategies, which is global target E of the Sendai framework, which has to be reached by 2010, 2020. And uh, it seems that the current pace of implementation is not fast enough to meet the 2020 deadline, and this may delay further progress on other targets and in the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Allow me your, to highlight five points that are indicative of the significant challenge ahead of us. First, the number of people affected by disasters is increasing. Over the period 2008-2018, disasters stemming from natural hazards have displaced an average of 23.9 million people each year, mainly due to climate-related hazards. This is a global and increasingly alarming reality. Two, we witness severe inequalities of burden sharing between low and high income country. The world's poorest people are bearing the highest toll and greatest cost of disasters. Human losses and asset losses relative to gross domestic product tend to be higher in the countries with the least capacity to prepare, finance, and respond to disasters and climate change. People living in poverty areas are less able to cope with shocks as they rarely benefit from social protection schemes, have fewer or no savings to smooth the impacts, their livelihoods depend on fewer assets, and they are more likely to live in low-value, hazard-prone areas in urban centers or depend on vulnerable ecosystems in rural areas. Third, climate change, the great risk amplifier. Climate change is a major driver of disaster losses and failed development. It will also make future conflicts more likely. Generally speaking, weather-related hazards take the lead in economic losses, with floods being the costliest hazards, although, as we all know, the geological hazards are the ones that kill most people. Climate change projections have come true much sooner than we expected, and at a calamitous scale, based on the IPCC projections, climate change will generate powerful storms, exacerbate coastal flooding, and bring higher temperatures and long droughts. I think that all those of you who are based in Paris last week, you suffered already one of these high temperatures with the record of 42.6 degrees Celsius. The effects of climate change are predicted to increase the irregularity and intensity of extreme weather events, as well as to drive slow onset disaster displacement risk through exacerbating existing natural resource scarcity, such as water stress. The fourth element I want to bring to your attention is the risk landscape changing quickly. The risk la landscape, as we know it, is indeed changing very fast. Diverse risks ranging from climate and biological to cyber risk have to be accounted for. The addition of new hazards by the Sendai framework has brought the new constituents, including finance, environmental, and private sector actors to the risk conversation. Expanded understanding of the full impact and the cascading effects of natural and man-made hazards is critical. And fifth, we cannot use the past as a reliable indicator of the future. Hazards in general and risk in a uh, systemic uh, understanding and approach are expe expected to exacerbate the problems that we face now, including in you know, the health sector, but also in agriculture. And it is hard to predict how changes, for example, in climate change in the atmosphere will affect the prevalence of agricultural diseases making plant infections more common. This may have dire consequences on yield crops and global nutritional and food safety, for example. Your Serene Highness, ladies and gentlemen, without scaled 
up action to reduce risk and strengthen re resilience, vulnerability and exposure will continue contributing to driving disaster risk upwards over the years to come. We must anticipate and allow room to deal with surprise and non-linear change with flexibility and nimbleness in our strategies and plans. We must act with urgency and with greater ambition, proportionate to the scale of the threat. And we must be more ambitious about the speed and magnitude of the changes we need to make. For this, we must act collectively. In that sense, the contributions that science can make by continuing to provide evidence-based information, promote scientific research of disaster risk patterns, causes and effects, and in supporting the interface between policy and science for decision-making will be determinant to achieve the target and goal of the Sendai framework and the sustainable development goals. We count on you to make this possible. Thank you very much and happy centennial celebration. So our final speaker before we move to the presentations is Lucina Zerbo, who is the Executive Secretary of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization. Thank you. <clears throat> Your Serene Highness, uh, President Citeris, President-elect Waller, members of the International Union of uh, Geodesy and Geophysics. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friend, it is my pleasure to add my voice to others from the international community at this opening session in order to congratulate the IUGG and the Ge and Ge Geodesy and Geophysics on its 100th anniversary. The fact that we have participation in this session alone from such a wide range of international organizations demonstrates the importance of the IUGG's remit and the esteem in which it's held. In fact, the IUGG predates us all as a body devoted to furthering international scientific cooperation and its establishment after the First World War was a beacon of hope following those terrible times. Then, when the time came for government to more actively promote cooperation in science with the advent of the United Nations and its specialized agencies, the IUGG was there with its networks and expertise to help bridge international, regional, and national activities in geosciences. So the roots of so many important intergovernmental agreements and instruments from climate research to disaster risk can be traced back to the work of the IUGG and its affiliates over the years. As someone active in the field of nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament and of course, a used to be geophysicist, as I call myself this day, it has always been clear to me that scientists play a vital role in overcoming obstacles to global decision making. The language of science is universal. It can reach beyond political differences and help build trust and understanding. Science brings countries together to address cross-border challenges that exist across the earth, which are out of reach for any single nation to address alone. In fact, in many of these areas, no solution is possible without the work of scientists. The Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is one of the greatest examples of the nexus between science, including earth science, and diplomacy. Almost since the start of the nuclear arms race, it was realized that ending explosive nuclear testing globally was absolutely vital in halting the pro proliferation of nuclear weapons. The end of the Cold War helped create the political space 
needed for negotiation on the legal framework for the test ban, which finally opened for signature in 1996. But this would have not been feasible without two decades of painstaking preparation by a group of scientists experts, the GSC, that brought together scientists from different countries, some no stranger to the IUGG, to conduct joint research into possible monitoring technologies and data analysis methods for the verification of a nuclear test ban. It was the work of these scientists that made negotiation of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty possible. They proved that a comprehensive zero-yield nuclear test ban could be verified, especially at a time when we hear allegations among the two main countries that some are conducting low-yield nuclear test explosion. This is indeed important. The backbone of the verification regime, this scientist device is an international monitoring system using seismic, infrasound, hydroacoustic, and radionuclear data technologies to search the underground, the oceans, and the atmosphere for possible nuclear detonations. A unique network of this type is obviously a great interest to seismologists, oceanographers, and atmospheric scientists, and we are delighted to collaborate with the IUGG and its members' organizations. IUGG members continue to play a key role in contributing to better understanding the uses of our international monitoring system, including through assessing our virtual data exploitation center platform to obtain data for scientific papers. This is a real feat of science and diplomacy, a technological network located worldwide that can catch signs of nuclear test explosion and also be used for a range of civil and scientific benefits, including tsunami warning, tracking of radionuclide after civil nuclear accident, and climate monitoring. New uses of the CTBT data are emerging all the time. For, for, exam for example, I think my colleague talked about volcanic ashes. The CTBT data is indeed used as well to monitor volcanic ashes as they disturb civil aviation. It's into no small part due to our interaction with the wider scientific and geoscience community. We have just held the fifth edition of our biennial CTBT Science and Technology Conference, our flagship event for shedding light on the use of data from our international monitoring system. The conference was the largest one ever, bringing together well over 1,500 scientists, technologists, academics, students, and other actives in the field related to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty verification. Many from a IUGG background were active at the conference, and I'm sure will again be at the next one in 2021. Your serene highness, ladies and gentlemen, let me close by commending the IUGG on the theme of this centennial conference. International cooperation in Earth and space science remained as important now as at any time in the last 100 years. We must guard against retreating into a world of scientific and policy silos. Such an approach has never served humanity well. Where the global nuclear test ban is concerned, we still have work to do. The treaty is to all intents and purposes in operation, but not legally in effect until eight specific countries complete their ratification processes. In order to help them along the way, communication between scientists, experts from those countries will continue to be crucial. I know that IUGG members will continue to, pay, to play their part. So here's to the IUGG first centenary, and here's to the next one. May we all hold aloft the beacon of scientific knowledge and collaboration 
and pass it on to the next generation. I thank you. So we're now moving to the awards section of this opening ceremony, and I'd like to invite the president-elect to join us on the stage. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is, of course, in a very important part of our celebrations, and that is to acknowledge the contributions and support of countries, which are members of the IEGG, and in particular, we've signaled out the founding members, the founding countries, the ones in 1919 that had the foresight to come together and join the IUGG. We have several um, categories and I will ask that those of you who are uh, uh, identified, when you come up, please stay on the stage so we can get a group photograph before we can sort of uh, move to the next category. So we've got the category of the founding member countries, we've got some categories for um, intergovernmental and non-governmental organizations, um, and we will be going through those um, in turn. So, with no further ado, as they say, these uh, are listed in alphabetical order. It's got nothing to do with the fact that uh, I come from Australia, but um, uh, I'd like to uh, invite Kurt Lambeck, former president of the Australian Academy of Sciences, to come up to the stage on behalf of Australia. And please keep your applause to the end. Thank you. Now, unfortunately, we, um, we could not have uh, or, um, Stephen De Witt, which is the president of the Belgium National Committee for IEGG, had to withdraw uh, at the last minute, so we do not have a representative from Belgium. Uh, Graham Clark, Deputy Head, Can Canadian Mission on France, on behalf of the Canadian National Research Council from Canada. Arnie Kazanev, IEGG Fellow and member of the French Academy of Sciences, representing France. Fausto Guzzetti, President of the, International, sorry, the Italian National Committee for IGG, representing Italy. It's not breakable. Um, Kuzushiga Obara, Representative of the Science Council of Japan, representing Japan. Joanna Hay, President of the UK National Committee for the IEGG. And last but not least, uh, Marcia McNutt, President of the US National Academy of Sciences, representing the USA. We have commemorative plaques for a number of organizations, some of whom uh, have, have spoken this morning, with whom the IGG has really long-term uh, partnerships, highly valued partnerships. 
The first one is uh, with UNESCO, Shamila Nea Bedoa, Bedella. <laughs> Vladimir Ryabinin, Executive Secretary, the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. No. The International Geoscience and Geoparks Program of UNESCO, uh, Christoph Vandenberg. And for the uh, representing the World Meteorological Organization, Elena Mana Enakova. And uh, Heidi Heckman, representing the International Science Council. Group. Okay. Uh, on behalf of the Committee on Space Research, or COSPA, uh, Jean Louis Fellow. <laughs> on behalf of the Scientific Committee on Ocean Research, I'd like to call the stage Maria Alexandrine Sicre. Not here. Okay, good. Unfortunately. The uh, World Data Systems, Rory Edmonds. The International Astronomical Union, Marie Teresa Lago. The International Union of Geological Sciences, Kunmin Chen. <laughs> the International Union of Radio Science, Mokato Ando. The International Lithosphere Program, Alexander Rudloff, and current Secretary General of the IEGG. <laughs> and representing the Consultative Committee for Time and Frequency, Noel DeMarc. Representing the World Climate Research Program, Detlef Stammer. <laughs> and 
and representing the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organisation, uh, Lasina Febo. And the American Geophysical Union, Robert Bell. The German Research Center for Geosciences, or GFZ, Ludwig Streuken. The International Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, ISPRS, Lena Halanova. The International Union of Soil Sciences, Takashi Kosaki. And the European Geosciences Union, Alberto Montanari. Now it is my great pleasure to uh, move to the next presentation, which will be a, uh, uh, the IG honorary membership for His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco. Now you have the citation in the program, and I just wish to just highlight a few of the statements in that citation, which sort of set the scene and, and really um, bring forth uh, the, the, the commitment and, and, uh, and support that His Serene Highness has given. His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco has accepted the offer of honorary membership of the IEGG, bestowed on him for his outstanding contributions to the promotion of science, specifically into climate change, water biodiversity and oceans. His Serene Highness uh, studied political science, economics, psychology, English, literature, the history of art, anthropology, geology, philosophy, sociology, German, and music at Amherst College, Massachusetts, United States of America. I think that's important to recognize that this, uh, you know, in a sense, this breadth of education has perhaps given him some interesting insights. But further than that, um, he is also now the head of state, of course, of Monaco, and is the president of the foundation that he has established to promote and contribute to actions protecting the environment and the planet. So he's not just talking about uh, the issues where he's also attempting to make a change. For this, he has been honored with numerous prizes from organizations around the world and awarded the degree of Dr. Honoris Causa from prestigious universities. Now this is interesting. His Serene Highness visited the North Pole by dog sled uh, and this journey was an opportunity for him to pay tribute to his great-great-grandfather, Prince Albert I of Monaco, who was a pioneer of modern oceanography and who was also one of the founders of the IEGG, one of the founders of the IEGG and its first vice president. So in 1906, Prince Albert I set out to Spitsbergen uh, in the archipelago of Svalbard 
on the most successful is four Arctic exploration campaigns. And this trip also helped to raise the world's awareness of, power, of planetary challenges, which in the short term represents risks related to climate change and the dangers of industrial pollution. So His Serene Highness, Prince Albert II, during a month-long expedition to Antarctica, not just Arctic, to the Antarctic, visited 26 scientific outposts and met with climate change experts to learn more about the impact of global warming on that continent. And during that trip, he also stopped at the South Pole. If you're in that area, why not? Now, this is really important. It makes him the only incumbent head of state who has visited both North and South Poles, as far as we know. Um, now, created at the beginning of the, of the century, uh, on the initiative of Prince Albert I, the Mediterranean Science Commission actually has as its objectives to promote multilateral international research and facilitate exchange of information between countries on the north and south sides of the Mediterranean Sea. So you can see the theme about exchange of information, coll collaboration, and, and going beyond national boundaries. Um, His Serene Highness also served as the international patron of the Year of the Dolphin, uh, declared by the UN in 2007. In 2006, Prince Albert also uh, established the Monaco Foundation dedicated to protecting the environment and encourages sustainable and fair management of natural resources. And the foundation supports the implementation of innovative and ethical solutions in three broad areas, namely climate change, water and biodiversity, all very worthy. With this, I invite uh, His Serene Highness to receive the IUGG Honorary Membership Medal from CAFE. Thank you so much, Madam President, Mr. President-elect, Madam uh, UNESCO's uh, Deputy uh, Director General for Sciences, uh, distinguished representatives of uh, international organizations, Your Excellencies, uh, honorable members of the IUGG, and guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Allow me, Madam President, to uh, thank you wholeheartedly for this, uh, for the bestowment of uh, this uh, honorary membership of the IUGG and how I'm touched by this uh, gesture. As you know, I'm very, uh, because of the, for the reasons that uh, were already said, but for the reasons that I will be able to develop in a few minutes, I'm linked to this organization. Uh, historically, and so that's why I'm very moved, very touched to be with all, 
with you all here this morning. And thank you, UNESCO, for, uh, for, for hosting this uh, gathering. Uh, I'm sorry, I will break uh, the tradition so far this morning. I will be continuing in French. I assume that you're all very fluent in French. And so, uh, if you allow me to uh, continue in the French language. À une époque où les nationalismes étaient dominants, où les menaces de conflit en Europe étaient permanentes, l'internationalisme a été une des grandes idées et un des principaux domaines d'action de mon trisaïeul, le prince Albert Ier, avant et après la Première Guerre mondiale. C'est pourquoi je suis très touché par votre invitation à venir aujourd'hui célébrer le centième anniversaire de la création de votre organisation, en cette année qui marque le début des commémorations en, en l'honneur de mon illustre prédécesseur, et dont le point d'orgue correspondra au centenaire de sa disparition en 2022. Il y a 100 ans exactement, alors que le traité de Versailles venait de sceller la paix sur le continent européen, se tenait à Bruxelles du 18 au 28 juillet la troisième conférence des Académies des Nations Alliées. Elle jetait les bases par-delà les frontières d'une coopération nouvelle entre organisations scientifiques, le Conseil international des recherches, aujourd'hui Conseil international pour la science, était né. Les partisans d'un partage des sciences de la mer l'avaient alors emporté sur les tenants d'une océanographie unique. Une section d'océanographie physique était créée au sein de l'Union internationale de géodésie et de géophysique et parallèlement une sous-section d'océanographie biologique prenait place dans l'Union internationale des sciences biologiques. Pour obtenir la cohésion entre ces deux entités, l'accord s'était fait à l'unanimité et par acclamation, sous la présidence d'une seule personnalité, le prince Albert Ier. Le 17 novembre de la même année, lors de la conférence constitutive à Madrid de la Commission internationale d'exploration de scientifique de la mer Méditerranée, dont nous allons également marquer le centenaire dans quelques mois, mon trisaïeul précisait l'esprit dans lequel il envisageait cette double présidence dans le contexte nouveau du multilatéralisme de, de l'après-guerre. Je le cite. « J'userai de toute l'influence que me donne ainsi une sœur spirituelle de la Société des Nations pour développer une science qui renferme plus que les autres les éléments nécessaires au rapprochement des forces morales de l'humanité. Car la surface des océans forme un lien entre tous les peuples, un lien auquel tous cherchent à se rattacher, et la profondeur des mers est le centre de la vie organique, celui dont nous venons tous comme les enfants de la même famille. En janvier 1921 et janvier 1922, les deux sections se réunissent plusieurs fois auprès de leur président à Paris, dans le monde universitaire, à l'Institut océanographique. Voulant faire mémoire de l'action de son bisaïeul, mon père, le prince Rénier III, avait accepté en 2001 d'accéder à une requête de l'Association internationale pour les sciences physiques des océans, ou IAPSO, héritière de la section créée à Bruxelles en 1919 et partie intégrante de votre organisation, en créant un prix de sciences physiques des océans dénommé Médaille Albert Ier de Monaco. J'ai pu récemment remettre cette distinction dans le cadre des prix de ma fondation le 20 juin dernier à Madrid, à Corinne Lequeré, professeure des sciences du changement climatique à l'Université d'East Anglia et présidente du Haut Conseil français pour le climat, pour sa contribution fondamentale à la compréhension de la biogéochimie des mers et en particulier à la quantification du rôle de l'océan dans l'absorption des émissions mondiales de carbone. Vous venez également de la célébrer le 12 juillet dernier à Montréal lors de votre dernière Assemblée Générale, au cours de laquelle elle a prononcé la traditionnelle Prince Albert Ier Memorial Lecture. Et je profite de cette occasion pour lui renouveler toutes mes félicitations et la remercier, car ses travaux illustrent à la fois l'urgence climatique et une forme d'espoir. L'ardente nécessité de la protection de l'océan a succédé au temps de la découverte et de la connaissance des mers, qui était celui de mon trisaïeul. Monaco s'efforce de continuer à suivre son testament et à faire fructifier son héritage en actualisant son message. 
Au travers de ses propres initiatives, comme en proposant à ses partenaires de relayer et d'amplifier leurs propres actions, la Principauté s'efforce d'être une voix de l'océan. En 1959, à une époque où les mers étaient encore largement vues comme exutoires de, de l'anthropisation, Monaco avait accueilli, à l'initiative de mon père, la première conférence scientifique sur l'élimination des déchets radioactifs. Elle avait contribué à alerter l'opinion publique sur les risques de l'immersion. De l'action de la Commission internationale d'exploration scientifique de la Méditerranée est né en 1976 un accord, international, un accord transnational franco-italo-monégasque-Ramoge, zone pilote de prévention et de lutte contre la pollution du milieu marin. L'accord Pélagos, qui implique les mêmes pays, a permis la création en 2002 d'un sanctuaire en Méditerranée de 87 500 km² pour les mammifères marins. En parallèle et en complément, une convention a été signée en 1996 avec une assise géographique plus vaste, l'accord ACOMAMS sur la conservation des cétacés de la mer Noire, de la Méditerranée et de la zone atlantique adjacente. Ces organisations ont toutes leurs sièges en principauté de Monaco, comme l'Organisation hydrographique internationale que le prince Albert Ier a également contribué à créer en 1921. Depuis 13 ans, depuis un peu plus de 13 ans, ma propre fondation milite pour le développement et le financement durable des aires marines protégées. Le Centre scientifique de Monaco, créé en 1960, poursuit aujourd'hui encore des travaux en biologie marine. Et pour achever ce trop rapide panorama des, des, des initiatives monégasques dans les champs qui correspondent aux promesses de mon trisaïeul, il y a 100 ans, je ne saurais oublier, bien entendu, l'action renouvelée de l'Institut océanographique dans le domaine de, de la médiation et de la sensibilisation auprès du grand public. À l'occasion du centenaire de votre union internationale, vous avez souhaité m'octroyer la qualité de membre d'honneur J'en suis très honoré et très fier. J'y vois à la fois une reconnaissance pour l'action séculaire de mon pays dans le domaine de l'océanographie, mais aussi d'autres sciences, et un encouragement à poursuivre et à prolonger mon engagement personnel dans la fidélité aux idées de celui qui nous réunit aujourd'hui, le prince Albert Ier. Il voulait, et je cite son discours à la Sorbonne, au commencement, des cours de l'Institut océanographique en 1906, il voulait rapprocher dans une collaboration étroite les savants et les travailleurs de nombreuses nations, montrer ce que les hommes peuvent produire quand ils oublient les questions trop souvent puériles qui les divisent, pour travailler ensemble au progrès de la science qui les unit. Le résultat prouve que le sacrifice des préoccupations étroites naît dans l'ignorance peut donner aux hommes la vraie fraternité qui efface la séparation artificielle des frontières. De, de, de la politique ou des religions et la véritable égalité qui exige la participation de chaque individu au travail selon ses facultés, sous l'égide d'une justice absolue. Ces principes et ces prescriptions peuvent aujourd'hui encore, je pense, nous, nous guider chercheurs, experts, éveilleurs ou porte-voix. Je vous souhaite plein succès pour vos travaux. Je vous remercie infiniment pour cet honneur que vous m'avez fait ce matin. Je vous remercie infiniment. Thank you very much. Yes, Serene Highness, thank you very much for your profound words and for joining us in our celebration this morning. Um, with that, I'd like to thank all our speakers in this opening session for their, uh, their words and thoughts about the centenary and invite everyone to adjourn for coffee in the foyer just outside. Thank you.
And just, just while you are doing that, I've got two announcements. The first one is that um, there is a representative from Belgium who will take the gold plaque um, and will probably do that just bef when I come to do my closing re remarks before the orchestral performance. Um, and the second one is that we would like to have a group photo just outside um, and we'll do that at the end of this session just before we adjourn for lunch. So we just pop outside briefly and get a group photo of everyone here. So we have three speakers in this um, next session on Earth and Space Sciences and Society. The first one is the past Secretary General. You've got a slightly garbled biopic of him in the, um, in the brochure here. Uh, but Alec has been for 12 years the um, Secretary General of IUGG working tirelessly to uh, make the union the success it has been over that time. So he's been a really key uh, player in this. Uh, Alex's scientific interests are mathematical geophysics and particularly hazard and risk. But I think he's going to talk um, here today about the history of the union. Good morning, everybody. It's, I look at the uh, clock, it's uh, just a few minutes before 12. In Germany, it's after 12, it is a good afternoon, but before 12, it's a good morning. Good morning to everybody. It's exciting to see all you here. Uh, <clears throat> today, my duty is to inform uh, you, those who know definitely this IUGG, what is IUGG, but a little bit more about the history or some events which happens in the history of IUGG during these hundreds of years. And this is a hundred years, it's a really exciting time slot, uh, not geologically, we have a geologist here in the room, it's geologically, it's a very short period of time, but still, I think it's exciting. And exciting also the following, that we don't know exactly when international scientific cooperation started, but in the really form of organized form, it started a century ago. And when? It started at the ruins of the world, actually, after the First World War. Scientists of all the world, actually, but those who were from allied countries, came together to discuss what is the future of science. Among them were the his Severe Highness Prince Albert I of Monaco, William Bowie, one of the uh, great geoscientists of uh, America, and Charles Lallemand, who became a first president of IUGG, Sir Henry Lyons, first Secretary General of IUGG, Sir Napier Shaw from United Kingdoms, and the Tanakadate sound from Japan. These four or six people who were really tremendously instrumental in the establishment of uh, uh, union, together with the uh, nine countries which you already saw and we celebrated their uh, <clears throat> hundred year support of the union. They together with other scientists from other fields came together to Brussels, Belgium, in July 1990. Here you see the, oh, maybe we can switch uh, lightning here if it's possible, and just to see more clearly the pictures. And uh, this is an old building, uh, which is an actually it's an existing building of the Académie des Sciences in uh, Brussels, and where, by the way, our sister organization, International Astronomical Union, celebrated recently 100 years as well. And uh, International Research Council was established at that time, together with several unions, and among the unions were the astronomy, biology, chemistry, geodesy and geophysics, mathematics, physics, and radio sciences. And the IUGG was established with six sections mentioned here in geodesy. At the beginning, it was sections, and in 1930, it changed to the International Association's name. And it was the six sessions in geodesy, terrestrial magnetism and electricity, today Yaga, uh, meteorology, 
physical sciences in the parentheses, you see the name of the present name of the associations. <clears throat> Seismology and volcanology, section of scientific hydrology, joined IUGG in 1922, and the last eighth international association uh, became existence as a part of IUGG in 2007 only. Now we are eight association body, and founding member, again, uh, I highlight here the countries which contributed a lot for the last 100 years. From the beginning, the aim of IUGG was to bring nations together and to enhance international scientific cooperation. Just a few slides, I have no time, but it is a something from the past. A few first general assemblies which were held around the world, and this is the first, oh sorry, sec, a third general assembly in Prague, which brought together something like 200 people together, delegates, they were delegates of the national members, country, and this is the fourth general assembly in Stockholm, Sorry, probably visibility is low, but still we are working, I understand, with the light, if it's possible to switch off the light. And the fifth General Assembly were held, was held in uh, Lisbon in 1933. In 1936, it was a General Assembly in Edinburgh. And you see, actually, this is a, just a zoom of the very big picture. It's already was about the 500 people there at this meeting. And the seventh General Assembly was held in Washington, D.C., and it was uh, one of the largest assembly uh, for the 20 years of existence of IUGG. It was present 800 people, but unfortunately, about 200 people, especially from France and UK, must uh, they, they, they needed to go back at home because the General Assembly was held in week after the declare of the, first, of the Second World War. It was a really very dramatic situation. Uh, and uh, still, the <clears throat> science, even at this tremendously difficult time, was at very high level uh, and appreciation by government. And I would like to tell specifically what I learned from the science and nature papers published at that time, that the President Roosevelt met with the leadership of American Geophysical Union and IUGG to tell them thanks for organizing this event and bringing the scientists here. I mean, he found a time at this difficult, <laughs> uh, really months of the beginning of the Second World War to meet scientists and to tell thanks to scientists. Well, the Second World War unfortunately interrupted the very productive years, 20 years of the International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics activities. And uh, it brought a lot of problems, but thanks to the Secretary General at that time, who was uh, really, again, tremendously instrumental in terms of the pre preserving funds of the IUGG, and provided uh, some support to the associations during the Second World War, if the activity international cooperation, related to international cooperation, uh, were performed somewhere in the world. And this was uh, something exciting to learn again from the nature and science papers. At that time, nature and science was very interesting to really highlight what happens at the international communities of the scientists and so on. Every, every let's say, several months they publish a papers uh, they, uh, telling, telling about the developments in the science. That's why, thanks to them, again, we have a lot of uh, quite interesting archive documents about the life of the union of IGG. Well, the, after the Second World War, there only was a, not only was a, a geopolitical landscape uh, much different, and there is a scientific landscape as well. We got the, we, we, we had radars at that time. We unfortunately also got a nuclear bombs and uh, rockets, but science was no longer, it is a, my colleague, uh, and very good friend, Joan Yoselin, who is a present here, Secretary General of IUGG, before uh, me became the 
uh, the, uh, were elected to this position, she mentioned that the science was no longer a gentleman pastime, that is nice to know, but had become respect, uh, respective as a must-know, and the governments were eager to fund this. And I will show later that, and already you heard from our guest today, uh, that IUGG started cooperation with many intergovernmental institutions at the beginning of their establishment after the uh, Second World War. Well, they say, uh, the General Assembly continued to grow in uh, numbers and it's uh, more than 2,000 scientists met in uh, Rome in 1954 and the delegates, for example, met with the Pope Pius XII uh, at the uh, opening ceremony. At the difficult time when the uh, Cold War just started, the IGG still was against of any uh, penetration of the political issues inside of the Union. That's why they accepted the uh, organizing of the 15th General Assembly in Moscow, Soviet Union, and the, uh, it was held in Kremlin, and bringing together the uh, more than 2,500 scientists. Uh, this is a, one of the events which was held, the first event in the Asia, and it was uh, in 2003 in Sapporo, Japan, and with the presence of uh, uh, His Majesty uh, Emperor of Japan and his uh, spouse. And that's the latest one. Just uh, less than two weeks ago, we had a wonderful meeting in Montreal, thanks to the government of uh, the Canada and the local organizing who made this event a success. Well, uh, IUGG was a promoting fundamental sciences. I wouldn't like to now go in some details, but just a few three examples. One of the examples about the solid earth. It's exciting that two presidents of IUGG, who were just one after another, contributed dramatically to the lithosphere dynamics and plate tectonics. One of them, to the Wilson, was uh, one of the founders of uh, uh, plate tectonics. At the same time, Vladimir Belousev was a great geologist who was not against, as I remember once he told me, I am not against plate tectonics. I am just uh, telling that plate tectonics is not the only uh, the, uh, theory which should be taken into account. Because he was a really big prominent uh, this person who uh, believed that it's the vertical motions plays a larger role compared to the horizontal motions uh, in the, of, the litis, uh, in the, of the lithosphere, which uh, were proposed by the uh, theory of plate tectonics. Well, another example is the climatic and environmental change. That, uh, uh, again, instrumental person was a Bernd Bolin, the IUGG bureau member. At that time, uh, already in IUGG started discussion about the uh, climate and climate change specifically. And his uh, uh, idea was to establish uh, some program to really deal with this changing and to understand how much the nature and how much uh, human contribute to this change. And it was established under the uh, International uh, uh, Council for Science at that time, ICSO, uh, which is now International Science Council, and uh, World Meteorological Organization, uh, World Climate Research Program. I will not speak here much because we have today our panelists who will tell us more about these uh, new activities of the World Climate Research Program. Another definitely issue already mentioned here, it's the International Geophysical uh, Year. And I would just uh, cite the well-known, world-known uh, geologist Harrison, who mentioned in 70 eight that the spectacular success international geophysical year run by international union of geodes and geophysics had received acclaim from the scientific world at large yes this world this this program initiated by one of the president of the union sydney chapman together with american colleague berkney in america at the private dinner and the idea was initially to generate the International Polar Year, and then they changed 
this and made a more, not change, change the title, making a more broader activity of the International Geophysical Year. And in 50 years, IUGG decided, together with the other unions and the International Science Council, established the so-called the, the years to celebrate the 50th years of anniversary of International Geophysical Year. IUGG promoted the uh, Electronic Geophysical Year and International Heliophysical Year. International Union of Geological Sciences initiated International Year of Planet Earth, supported by IUGG, and the International Polar Years, co-sponsored by ICSO and the WMO. Well, uh, IUGG promotes the cooperation not only in science purely, but also in science education. We have a program today. We have a speaker who will tell, uh, who will tell about the program together with International uh, um, um, Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. We also, uh, that is uh, outside of the Trieste events, uh, co-sponsored by IUGG. And also we co-sponsoring the events uh, uh, within the framework of the International uh, Science Council, like, for example, recent event in Bhutan uh, related to the teachers, the work workshop uh, for teachers about the climate change. International cooperation and partnership is in the heart of IUGG. As mentioned today morning, it's the first agreement was signed with UNESCO in 1946. The first agreement was signed with the WMO in 54, and with establishment of Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and international hydrological programs, we started to collaborate very closely with these two major programs of UNESCO. Well, here, unfortunately, you can't see now, or even I don't see here from here, the all names of the organization which we cooperate right now, and this is a, a really important that it's our scientists contribute to the activities of many intergovernmental organizations, interna uh, international uh, interdisciplinary bodies of the International Science Council, as well as with our partners like American Geophysical Union, European Geoscience Union, and the Asian and Oceanic uh, Geophysical uh, uh, Geosciences U uh, Society, which unfortunately today not with us because they are running, starting from today, the general, their general assembly. Well, we cooperate since 2004 with eight international unions dealing with earth and space sciences. And you can see the list of this organization. Uh, we are very happy that many of them uh, attended today this meeting. And tomorrow we will have a geo unions meeting. We, at least once a year, meet together to uh, just to, 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 to understand what we would like to do and to create a new, perhaps, programs uh, to go forward together. Not just uh, uh, compete, but uh, cooperate in true sense here. Uh, science diplomacy. Uh, I just would like to cite this is a paper, I think, should, it's very small, it's uh, uh, not, will appear nature next uh, issue of nature. Uh, as we mark the centennial of international research cooperation, humanity faces the biggest challenge ever, living sustainably on the planet. It has never been more important for our society to understand and value science. I think it's uh, really important that today we, we have a, uh, really many societal problems which we would like to solve. And uh, one of them, it's mentioned also by our guest here from UNDRR, is the uh, issues related to disaster risk reduction. In 2015, this uh, group of scientists uh, came together from the scientific unions and from the two councils at that time and to, uh, to uh, really prepare the synthetic paper about this, how science can contribute to disaster risk reduction. And this uh, uh, summary of this uh, synthesis paper was distributed at the conference, UN Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction in Sendai. Uh, IUGG participated in many meetings around the world to uh, highlight the importance of science uh, for disaster risk reduction and for disaster resilience. Uh, you see here there is a meeting which was attended by the uh, Crown Prince at that time. Now he is a, um, uh, he's a um, uh, um, um, uh, emperor of uh, Japan. 
And also it's the four members of IUGG here, the Gordon McBean and uh, three others who are speaking on behalf of science and it's uh, speaking about the how actually science makes uh, 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 predictions in terms of the forecasting, in terms of the uh, real assessment of the risk and how, how these issues can be improved. Uh, also, uh, thanks to IAPSO and SCORE, one of the uh, committees of the International Science Council, they came together to give answer to the J7 science minister when uh, they call that it's uh, very important to know the future of our oceans. This uh, uh, um, uh, synthesis paper also was developed and submitted to the science minister before their next meeting. The first meeting was in Germany when it was uh, in 2015, and the next meeting in eight months held uh, in uh, Japan. And thanks to scientists who worked within this short period of time to generate this answer to the J7 minister uh, on the future of the ocean and its seas. Uh, another our association, International Association of uh, Geodesy, uh, made a really very significant contribution and together with nations, they convinced the United National General Assembly and this assembly established a, a permanent subcommittee on geodesy to provide stability and long-term planning for the global geodesic reference frame. Well, in summary, IUGG, IUGG for a hundred years, they uh, contributed to science and to outreach programs through the many uh, different uh, uh, areas and together with our partners. For example, International Lithosphere Program is a joint program with the International Union of Geological Sciences. Other, it's, uh, you al I already mentioned, and most recently we are also supporting International Year of Global Understanding. Uh, to, uh, this is a program of International Geographical Union. Science for Society, again, it's mentioned, it's one of important issues, and we are working together with nations and intergovernmental bodies to really understand the problems of the climate change, hazard and disasters, mineral resources and water, etc. Science for developing work, IGG plays a spectacular role actually in bringing the state of art, thank you very much, it's at the end, finally. It's a, a science to less affluent countries of the world. We build capacity and science education around the world, and especially in the less developed countries. And uh, the data and information is one of the major priority. Here I would like to mention again, International Association of Geodesy, Global Geodesic Observing System, as a one of the example which bring together many observing uh, the uh, services, data services, and generate the observation of the Earth from space and from the Earth itself. The scientific products, it's uh, one of the essential things what the IOGG developed for the 100 years, and these products are well known for scientists, less known for the people who keep the smart smartphones in their, for example, their pocket, and the geoid established and the smartphones, it's based on the equations generated by the International Geomagnetic Reference Field, and for example, navigation system today cannot survive without this International Terrestrial Reference Frame. IGG plays also important role in regulatory, uh, uh, regu uh, important, uh, important regulatory role in geosciences. And I think that's uh, all what I wanted to tell today. And I would like also to highlight this uh, very important uh, uh, the book, which we recently, it's a special issue published in the uh, Journal of History of Earth and Space Science uh, and related to the history of our union. And please enjoy reading this book. Thank you very much. I think in the interests of time, we'll move um, swiftly on without um, offering the opportunity for questions or comments. But there, are, there is time this afternoon during disc panel discussions. So our next speaker is Valérie Masson-Delmotte uh, from the French Alternative Energies and Atomic Energy Commission in Paris. And she's going to be talking about climate and our planet. Now, Valérie is um, a climate scientist, and she's been one of the key players in I think what we would all agree has been an incredibly important organization for 
tackling the, the questions around climate change, the IPCC. So she's been a, 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 a significant part in that organization for a number of years now. She's also an author, and um, as you'll see in the little biopic there, she's written books for the general public as well as for children. So uh, clearly somebody who wants to communicate science as well to non-scientists. So I invite you to take the stage. Can you please put my slides up? So, dear colleagues, it's an honor to be invited to speak on the occasion of the celebration of this centennial anniversary. And you can see on this slide the global warming stripes going from cold to warm with one bar per year since 1850. I would like to share my personal reflections on a success story, a failure story, and a transformation story, looking both backwards as well as forward. Let's first look backward. It's extremely impressive to consider the climate science achievements of the past century. Thanks to the deployment, strengthening, and improvement of observation techniques, we now have the capacity to monitor key aspects of the climate system, changes in the Earth's energy budget, changes in global and regional climate from the top of the atmosphere to the depths of oceans. This has been achieved thanks to technological progress, logistical progress, international cooperation, including in situ monitoring, and since the 1970s, remote sensing from space. We also benefit from impressive progress in process-based understanding, theoretical developments, as well as the revolution of numerical modeling. Starting from weather forecast, which combines the skills of monitoring data assimilation and modeling, the field of climate modeling has expanded in the second part of the 20th century. Climate and Earth system models play a key role in understanding how the climate system operates, why it has changed in the past, even how extreme events characteristics have been altered, and what are physically plausible future climate changes depending on our action. World media have recently celebrated the 50th anniversary of the first footstep of a human being on the moon as a major achievement. No such echo has been given to the Charney report, released almost exactly 40 years ago, which was the first scientific assessment of the role of greenhouse gases emitted as a result of human activities on global climate. The Charney report estimated the range of climate sensitivity a matrix which measures the most probable warming at the Earth's surface, resulting from a doubling of the atmospheric CO2 concentration, starting from pre-industrial levels. It was estimated to be near 3 degrees, with a range of plus or minus 1.5 degrees Celsius. So far, this range has been supported by more evidence from paleoclimate observations, theory, and much more sophisticated numerical climate models. It's, however, more urgent than ever to better constrain this range, given its implications for future risks, as well as for our margin of action, our remaining carbon budgets, through breakthroughs in basic climate research. My own research has been focused on past climate and was driven by curiosity. Along the last century, new knowledge has also been produced, thanks to the use of natural archives, which we can see as retroactive observations to characterize and understand past climate variations. Past climates allow us to understand the full range of variability of the Earth's climate. They give us access to a diversity of natural experiments on the Earth's climate so that we can unveil the time scales of feedbacks and responses to geological or astronomical forcing. Past climates also provide benchmarks against which we can test the robustness of climate and Earth system models. The fact that these models can correctly simulate the broad features of extreme climate states of the geological history, from Eocene warmth to ice ages, as well as the response to orbital or volcanic forcing, as well as the characteristics of climate variability during the historical period, all of that is key for our confidence in projections. 
Our knowledge of past climates demonstrates the unprecedented perturbation already caused by human activities on the atmospheric composition, altering the Earth's energy budget. Welcome in the Anthropocene. Last week, new studies have confirmed that the current one degree Celsius rise of global mean surface temperature is larger, faster, and more globally synchronous than at any time of the past 2,000 years. Our best estimate is that 100% of this warming is due to human activities. We already see and live with the reality of this changing climate, with gradual trends, as well as changes in the characteristics of extreme events, which affect ecosystems and livelihoods everywhere. To finish these reflections on a success story of knowledge developments, I stress that the patterns of what has been observed in the last 30 years, warming of land, land larger than above oceans, increased ocean heat content and sea level rise, Arctic amplification, intensified heat waves, all of that had been correctly anticipated by the first ocean atmosphere simulations published 30 years ago. With more than 20,000 peer review publications with the key word climate change in the scientific literature, relevant knowledge production from all disciplines is accelerating. Part of this acceleration results from the pressure to publish, the expansion of predatory journals, which are major challenges for the rigor of science and its credibility, and we need to act on that. Part of this acceleration also reflects the broad development of climate change sciences, including understanding impacts and risks in all regions, all sectors, all ecosystems, exploring options for risk management and enhancing resilience, links with sustainable development, preserving ecosystems, improving human well-being, while reducing greenhouse gas emissions. With more than 20,000 peer review publications per year, more than ever, we need internationally coordinated efforts to assess the state of knowledge from the critical analysis of the scientific literature. I would like to thank all the authors and reviewers who volunteer contribute to the assessments of the IPCC. The IPCC has celebrated its 30th anniversary last year and is currently producing Herculean efforts to release a new set of reports within the sixth assessment cycle. Last year, we've released the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It was a policy request, and it's the most integrated assessment across disciplines to date. I want to remind you that at the current rate of warming of 0.2 degrees per decade, Global warming will reach 1.5 degrees between around 2030 and 2050, just when our children are at our age. This report illustrates how much every fraction of warming, every half a degree matters in terms of future impacts and risks. It shows that for the preservation of healthy ecosystems and for health, livelihoods, food security, water supply, human security and economic development, there are clear benefits to limit global warming at the lowest possible level and at 1.5 compared to 2 degrees warming or higher. Risks are not the same everywhere. They are disproportionately higher in some regions, in drylands, small island states, least developed countries or the Arctic. Limiting warming to 1.5 compared to 2 degrees of warming would avoid exposing several hundred million people susceptible to poverty to growing climate-related risks. And major adaptation efforts are needed to manage risks, even for low levels of warming. Our report also illustrates how much every year matters in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Due to the cumulative effect of CO2, stabilizing global warming can only be achieved by sharp reductions in emissions and reaching net zero emissions as soon as possible. It also implies to reduce the net effect of, on climate of other emissions, which also cause air pollution, which would have immediate benefits for air quality around cities and for health. 
If pledges of governments expressed in 2015 during the Paris Agreement are realized, global greenhouse gas emissions would continue to increase until 2030. That level of ambition would lead to global warming of more than 3 degrees by 2100. By contrast, limiting warming to 2 degrees would imply to reduce emissions of CO2 by a quarter by 2030 and reach net zero by 2070. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would imply to reduce CO2 emissions by half by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. It's not completely impossible, but it would require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented transitions in all systems, energy, land use, urban systems, industry and infrastructures, using a range of technologies and behavior changes. With more than 40 billion tons of CO2 emitted every year in the atmosphere, every year matters. And finally, this report shows how much every choice matters. It builds on the intersection between climate change impacts, options for adaptation, options for mitigation, and sustainable development goals. And by using this multidimensional analysis, it shows how ethical, fair, and just transitions can be designed. Each pathway has a different synergy and trade-off with the sustainable development goals. In each context, a careful mix of measures to adapt to climate change, protect those vulnerable, and reduce emissions can help achieve sustainable development goals through a low-carbon, climate-resilient development pathway. Our assessment shows clearly that the highest benefits are achieved in pathways with low energy demand, low consumption of non-renewable material, and healthy diets that reduce pressure on land, as well as food system greenhouse gas emissions. Every fraction of warming matters, every year matters, and every choice matters. I would also like to reflect on a failure story. Oops, I don't have my failure story slide. Despite decades of new knowledge development, confirming that we are causing global climate change and 30 years of IPCC assessments, I wanted to show you that global emissions of most greenhouse gases keep rising year after year. It sometimes looks like the unfolding of a Greek tragedy, where we see happening what had been anticipated decades ago by climate and earth system modeling. The small window of opportunity to limit global warming at low levels is closing fast with rising emissions. Failure to act today will increase the burden on young generations who will have to face the consequences of global warming, potential irreversible loss of ecosystems, increasing crisis management, and more costly, difficult, and risky options to manage risk. Climate change literacy remains low amongst decision makers and the general public. Our science is not always part of school and university curricula. Climate change skills are not part of the international benchmarking of education programs and universities. We are also facing merchants of doubt who are very efficient to use media and social networks to spread misinformation on the reality of climate change, its costs and its risks. Sometimes, scientists from other fields of expertise, even within IUGG, have been the most active to attack climate sciences and spread denial. Today, most people around the world are using social media to have access to information. The voice of science in social media is too weak. I want to stress that there are great stories to be deconstructed. The story which denies the evidence that our activities have profoundly disruptive atmospheric composition and climate, with impacts that are already visible and which will continue to grow with more global warming. The story that governments, informed by information produced by the scientific community, will bravely make the decisions necessary for the long-term common good. The story of fatalism and powerlessness which plays on our fears of committed changes and on the inability of decision makers to act at the scales of the issues at stake. We must deconstruct these stories and show how to deploy all the levels of action at all scales now, wisely, 
collectively and design the solutions that can be deployed tomorrow through research and innovation. Improved monitoring, understanding and modeling of the Earth system is part of these solutions. Climate services, providing climate information relevant for decision making, including an assessment of uncertainties of projections at regional, sectoral scales, they are also part of these solutions. After looking backwards at successes and failure stories, I would like to look forward and think of a transformation story. We need science to be more easily accessible to everyone. We need to make sure that our publications are publicly accessible to all citizens as a fair return for their support to science through their tax. We need to support scientists so that they are trained to engage in social media public debates, participatory approaches, and recognize these activities to be part of their jobs. We need new mindsets with a solid understanding of climate change risks and solutions. We need to support the integration of research activities at the interface between climate and climate change science, including social sciences, at the interface between climate and biodiversity, to better understand nature-based solutions. We need to strengthen bridges between the academic world, practitioners and engineers. We need to empower our students, young people, so that they understand the science and they understand how to act in support of sustainability. We need to work with the cities where our research centers and universities are located in order to accelerate transitions where we live. We need to learn what are the needs of society and develop new approaches for the co-design and co-production of knowledge to, trans to support transformation. Scientists, you know, are sometimes the worst examples of cognitive dissonance. Working on climate change while traveling by plane around the world to attend meetings. We need to reflect on our own practices. How can we deploy pathways to reduce emissions associated with our research activities? while producing both basic knowledge and knowledge supporting societal transformation? How can we better use solutions of the 21st century, such as video conferencing, to stimulate intellectual exchange, cooperation, emulation, and capacity building in all countries? Let's look forward. Ice cores from Antarctica are extraordinary time machines, which I used for my own research. And with other Antarctic scientists from various research areas, we tried to reflect on storylines for future change in the Antarctic region by 2070. You can see that on the screen. In a century from now, by 2119, will we have preserved Antarctica as an area of science, cooperation, and peace? Will we have preserved its unique ecosystems? Will we have prevented major flow of ice that would lead to committed long-term sea level rise. What will be the state of the cryosphere, the state of climate, the state of biodiversity, and the state of humanity in a century from now? Will we have improved Earth system monitoring, early warning systems, seasonal and decadal predictions, near-term and long-term projections to build resilience and manage risks? Will we have managed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve well-being for all, leaving no one behind, through technological, frugal, and social innovation? In short, will we have managed to use science for human progress? All this will depend on our actions in the coming years and decades. My last slides also shows the warming stripes of my first slide, along different socio-economic pathways with different patterns of development and different patterns of greenhouse gas emissions. As scientists, we must claim to have a voice in the affairs of our cities, to carry the voice of science, to put science at the service of the transformation of our societies, because I think we must act, all of us, in a lucid and responsible way for the greatest challenge that we must succeed to overcome together. Let us look forward and thank you for your attention.
again, in the interest of time, I think it's better if we defer questions and discussion to the panels this afternoon. So uh, our last speaker for this morning's session is uh, Marcia McNutt. So Marcia is currently the president of the United States National Academy of Sciences. That's the adhering body to IUGG in the US. She's had a, a varied and interesting career. She started off in academia at MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, but since then she's worked at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. She's been in charge of the US Geological Survey, and um, she's currently, as I say, in, in charge of the um, National Academy of Sciences. She's been very interested in disasters. You'll see from her bio that she was actually um, uh, in the USGS when the Blackwater Horizon disaster took place, and I know that she then went and worked in the, um, in, in essentially with the White House and how to manage that. So very much in the, 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 the front end, the fast end of societies, disaster into society. So I'll hand the floor to, to Marcia for her talk about disasters in society. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. I think according to the schedule, my talk is about ending now. Uh, so in order to try to uh, not make you miss too much of lunch, I will try to get through this as quickly as possible. So the topic I was given is disasters in society, and there's probably a few areas where the geosciences impacts uh, society more than in the area of disaster risk reduction. So um, the goal in natural hazards research is not to allow natural hazards to become human disasters. And that is um, what we are all uh, working uh, hard to do. We can't stop natural hazards from occurring for the most part, but what we can try to do is build resilience into our communities to, present, to prevent them from becoming human disasters in terms of loss of life and loss of economic opportunity. And um, here I've just contrasted uh, two disasters that happened during my watch at the USGS. On the left was um, the one single building that collapsed in the Chilean earthquake in um, 2010 versus uh, a scene from the uh, earthquake in Port-au-Prince, uh, Haiti. And as you all know, Haiti is still trying to recover from that earthquake, whereas I think um, this was, uh, being the only building that collapsed in Chile, it was because of the very strong building codes that um, were, uh, that, that still operate in uh, Chile. And I think whoever put that building up probably was put into jail because that building collapsed. Okay, so um, as you all know, hazards come in a variety of forms. There are hazards for which we have excellent warnings of where and when they occur. And uh, one good example is floods. Um, flood, no one should be surprised of a flood. Of course, there are flash floods, but for the most part, we have good warnings when a flood's going to happen. There are other hazards for which we have only limited warnings for where and imprecise warnings of, of uh, where they're going to be. And those are tornadoes. Um, we know that there are parts of the United States, for example, where we're more likely to have tornadoes, but we have very um, short um, warnings ahead of time of when a tornado is going to happen. There are the kinds of hazards where we've got days of uh, warnings ahead of time of when, but the location of impact is uh, still imprecise, um, but it's improving, and uh, hurricanes or cyclones are good examples of those. And we also have um, hazards, uh, sometimes little warning, although the at-risk locations are known. 
and wildland fires um, at the urban interfaces are good examples of those. And we're having increasing or risks of those in the United States where we can have entire communities that are wiped out literally at a moment's notice. The Paradise Fires that happened um, near the um, Sierra Nevada are a good example where people couldn't even evacuate or hardly evacuate in time. And then uh, the perfect example of uh, hazards where we have no warning of when or the size, but the locations can be forecast uh, very well, are earthquakes. We know where the faults are, but we don't know when um, the uh, earthquake's going to happen. So variety of types of um, how well we can predict where and when, but despite this variety, what we find is that the loss of life and property is not necessarily dependent on how accurately the time of the natural hazard can be predicted and with how much warning, or how carefully the location uh, of the affected population can be pinpointed, or how precisely the magnitude of an individual event can be forecast. So um, prediction is not really the most important thing. The critical factors are how science is applied to engineering resilience into the communities, how science is translated into policies and planning, and how the public responds to hazard alerts. Those are far more important than prediction. And I think that far too often, emphasis is put on prediction when it actually should be put on resilience and in the social science of how the public is responding to those alerts and uh, the resilience policies and planning. So this argues for adopting a convergent approach. And that's going to be the topic of my talk today. So what is convergence? Convergence is the integration of engineering physical sciences, computation, life sciences, and also the social sciences with profound benefits for medicine, health, energy, and the environment. This originated as a third revolution in biomedicine, and it was intended to make healthcare more affordable. And I'm going to argue today that it can also make um, natural hazards research more effective. And this is a picture of Phil Sharp from MIT who coined the term convergence in its use in biomedical research. So this was a, a paper that was published as a policy forum in Science Magazine in uh, 2011. And they, he argued in this paper with Bob Langer that multidisciplinary thinking and analysis will permit the emergence of new scientific principles and opportunities in biomedicine, and I would argue the same is for natural hazards research. So now, what's the difference between interdisciplinary research and convergence? Well, in interdisciplinary work, students are not taught differently, but can be bridges between fields. In convergence, students are educated in highly complex multidisciplinary problem solving. So that there's a difference in how students are taught. In interdisciplinary work, researchers still reside in conventional departments, whereas in convergence work, researchers actually reside in multidisciplinary institutions that are devoted to convergent type problem solving. And in interdisciplinary work, funding still flows through disciplines, putting projects at double or triple jeopardy in how they are trying to be funded. Whereas in convergence work, special funding programs are devoted to convergent research projects. So there's a single funding line that funds social sciences, geoscientists, uh, engineers, um, data experts, et cetera, all in one funding line to do a single project in a convergent type uh, formula. 
So elements that enable convergence, dedicated institutions bring the researchers together. So the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, where researchers are working in nimble teams that combine biology, chemistry, mathematics, computation, in, uh, engineering with medical science and clinical research to solve problems. Competitions, uh, the convergence idea challenge, or special initiatives. This is a special initiative at the uh, NSF. Um, uh, it's one of their 10 big ideas. Um, but to date, hazards research has not been prominent uh, in convergent projects. So is there a reason? What benefits could accrue? And that's what I want to argue um, today. Convergent approaches can extend to hazards research to benefit human health and safety. In fact, they were already there. I would argue that hazards research was born convergent, and in particularly in increasing seismic safety. This is a good example of convergent research in action. Um, saving lives from destructive earthquakes Earthquakes are unpredictable. It's, it's probably the least predictable of all natural hazards. Hundreds of thousands can perish in a single event. Death from collapsing buildings, exposure from homelessness after the effect, and secondary effects from failure of infrastructure. You don't have water, you don't have electricity, and so there are health impacts. So if we look at how we've built seismic resilience over the years, though, First of all, it started with geoscientists who mapped where are areas of earthquake hazard. They worked then with engineers to uh, figure out how do we design buildings that will withstand the strong ground motion from earthquakes. And then the engineers worked with architects to figure out how do um, buildings actually move in those events and how do we make sure that they will stand rather than collapse. And then the engineers and the geoscientists and the architects work with policymakers to make it law that you had to build buildings according to those designs. And one earthquake after another, the designs improved and, the, and this resiliency was built into communities. And it happened in the US, it happened in Chile, it happened in Japan, it happened in many countries around the world. Now, um, we can see that this could, could happen in uh, many other hazards. So we look at hurricanes. They carve a wide swath of variable uh, destruction with health impacts from exposure from displacement, homelessness, contaminated drinking water, communicable diseases, emotional distress, toxic uh, contaminants. Um, we can imagine that um, better uh, communication, better work with social scientists, better uh, ability to communicate alerts um, would uh, improve in uh, hurricanes. Um, here's just an example from the journal uh, Science um, Advances of how social media, so working with experts in social media could improve um, understanding how to use um, this is Twitter activity to understand the impacts of a hurricane. Now this just shows the social media activity in the upper uh, panel before the, um, uh, this was um, uh, from uh, Superstorm Sandy, and the lower um, uh, panel as uh, Sandy impacted the east coast of the United States. And you can see in the red for key words associated with the superstorm, how it lights up as the storm went up the east coast of the US. And um, uh, in the lower diagram, it shows in time and hours um, peak um, activity of certain keywords, and you could see sort of a delay in, for example, uh, peaks on the keyword of gasoline, how gasoline shortages happened in a delay 
after um, the storm. So Twitter can be a way to understand what the impacts of a storm are. When do food shortages hit? When do water shortages hit? When is disease coming in? Now, in a place like the US where there's maybe more infrastructure, it might not be so important. But in a place without a lot of infrastructure, Twitter can be a way to understand what are the impacts of natural hazards as they are unfolding and you can help to make sure that they are not evolving into disasters that can't be anticipated. Um, convergence in cascading disasters. We are seeing the emergence of cascading disasters. Here's an example. An earthquake leads to a nuclear meltdown. Could that possibly happen? Yes, because it already has. Um, how does a nation design resilience and how does it design the response? Or floods lead to toxic chemical release. A drought leads to an insect infestation. Um, we can use convergence to understand better how these cascading disasters unfold and how we could um, design resilient communities to them. Or convergence and compound disasters. Um, uh, Ricardo Menya this morning was a perfect lead up to this um, talk when he talked about climate change as a, um, as a, a, a natural hazard uh, amplifier because it uh, increases the um, uh, chances of uh, coincident extremes where uh, floods that are fueled by sea level rise, plus storm surge, plus high tide, plus intense rainfall, these, um, uh, these uh, extremes all happening at the same time, or fires fed by prolonged drought, plus extreme temperature, all happen at the same time. Again, convergence can help us understand the likelihood of this happening and how to respond to them. So to promote convergence, um, I'm just going to end with we need dedicated institutions. We need special funding streams. We need enthusiastic university administrators. I can't, um, I can't uh, emphasize that enough. We need administrators who understand they need to think in different ways, not along conventional disciplinary boundaries. We need sympathetic promotion and tenure committees if they are going to allow young people to work outside of their conventional lanes. And we need education programs that teach convergent thinking and don't pigeonhole students in narrow boundaries. Um, and, and finally, just this, uh, another paper, uh, driving convergence with human diversity. We need diverse thinking to come from uh, in engaging the full diversity of human um, knowledge in this. Convergent science will require human diversity, individuals with different backgrounds and life experiences to drive it forward. And we can start here in the IUGG. It can't be just geodesy. It can't be just geophysics. We have to embrace the full diversity of human knowledge and starting here in the IUGG if we're going to solve these problems. So what sort of outcomes might ensue? New partnerships between dissimilar disciplines, new career paths for students, new industries clustered around convergent institutes, and geosciences increasingly perceived as contributing to competitiveness, resiliency, health, and quality of life. Thank you very much.